Um, I'm Rena McKeith, I'm one of the uh, studio art directors in WUGA, and today I want to give you a brief introduction into the topic of narration using art direction in mobile games. And this is a very big topic, so I'm afraid in 20, 30 minutes I'm not going to be able to cover it in a lot of detail. But if there's anything you want to ask about, you know, feel free to ask at the end, or of course come up to me at any point, and I'll talk to you for hours. I've done talks on this for hours, so I'll try and condense it down as much as possible. So of course, any good story, you have to start at the beginning. And the beginning is switch on your, uh, your clicker, of course. Um, so I want to set the scene a little bit and give you a little background about me and why this is such an important topic for me. So I've been working in, in games for about eight or nine years or so. And you can see some of the titles that I've uh, launched in that time as an artist, as a lead artist, and an art director. And you can probably see that they all have something in common. These are mostly casual, free-to-play mobile games. But before I moved into games, I worked in animation. And that's really informed my process and how I think about creating art direction and the art vision for the games that I do. Because throughout my development cycle, I'm trying to balance these three protagonists in my mind. So this is narration, art direction, and mobile games. And of course, throughout this talk, I'm going to get into in great detail about narration and art direction. But first, I'd like to take a moment to just talk about casual, the actual casual mobile games and what I see are the key characteristics of those and how they impact storytelling. So these are the characteristics. And I want to draw your attention predominantly. I mean, we all work in this industry. We know it pretty well. But first, when you think about how the audience downloads your game, there's no barrier to that. These are free games. You don't have to have any investment in the game before you download it. But if there's no investment, then there's no commitment. If someone buys a 60 or 70 or AAA game, they're going to stick with you for a while. Even if it's terrible, they're at least going to give you an hour or two. They have that commitment. They, ha they have a value for your game from the outset. But in a free-to-play game, they don't value it yet. There's no emotional resonance for them just yet. You have to build that over time. So every click you make matters. Every step you add matters. The session lengths are short, so every piece of information you give matters. And some would say that in this context, you can't tell a story. How can you tell a story in five minutes? Well, I would say that, OK, here's an example from Wooga. This is Jelly Splash. It's been live for over three years, nearly four years now. And when you think about that, now suddenly you realize, OK, those short sessions over the course of three or four years add up to an immense amount of time in which to tell a story. But you do have to think about storytelling in a different way. So to put a bit of context, I'd like to go back to the past a little bit and think about how art and narration works. OK, right, yeah, this is way too far back. I'm not going to go this far. It's a 30-minute talk. We can't talk about it in that length of time. You know, we're going, I'm going to come forward a bit in time. I'm going to talk about this, Donkey Kong. When Donkey Kong came out, obviously there's arcade games coming out all the time, but Donkey Kong did something revolutionary. It did this. A tale of true love, vanquishing all. And you might think, you know, does that actually have an impact? Well, of course, you can't underestimate the revolutionary gameplay mechanic of Donkey Kong. It was really important. But not only that, it gave players something that they didn't have before. It gave them a framework to understand what it was they were doing. It gave them the why. Why am I doing it? Why am I here? Why do I care about this character? And a character that, in the end, is probably one of the most enduring and popular characters in games today. And this why is incredibly important, because it keeps people coming back, keeps them caring about your game. Now, when we talk about narration, and the narration of Donkey Kong follows this pattern. There's a set the scene, an inciting incident, you go on a journey, and then there's resolution at the end. But of course, in a game that may last two or three years, you're not going to have the opportunity for resolution. So you have to think about how you do your story in the context of the game that you're creating, the media you're creating. Now, Terence Lee did a really good description of this. And you can see that as you go through these, narration takes different forms. Obviously, first you get text on a page in a book. Then obviously in a film, you've got this whole new range of storytelling tools at your disposal. You've got sensory experiences, audio, you know, costumes, whatever, editing. And all of these add to how your storytelling tools that you can use. And of course, in games, you have this whole new dimension at your disposal, which is the interactivity. Because the players are playing your game. They're making choices. And that builds a world for them, a story that's unique to them, as they try and understand your mechanics and understand your world. 
Now, obviously, storytelling has come a long way since Donkey Kong. <laughs> these are obviously some of my favorites. But of course, these can build on the storytelling techniques of film because they have that player investment. Now, I want to give you an example of you know, how player investment is really important. Now, you're sitting in a cinema. You've just paid your tickets, and you see this wall of text. Because I'm pretty sure everyone recognizes what this is, right? <laughs> and you see a wall of text, and you're OK to read this wall of text or spend an hour playing a tutorial because you've invested already. Well, I can tell you now, there is no chance your mobile game player is going to sit through that. They're gone already. They're on to the next thing because they want to get to the game, and you've distracted them with a wall of text. So if you can't tell your story this way, how are you going to tell your story? Well, I would suggest that Star Wars has already solved this problem in the very next scene. They show you this. Now, I'll tell you, this tells you everything you need to know about Star Wars. You've got a tiny ship in a distant galaxy. This isn't Earth. We don't know where this is. This is far away. And they're trying to escape from a dominant, massive, highly technologically advanced enemy. It's Star Wars. This is exactly what Star Wars is. And they tell it in one image. And I tell you, you've probably even forgotten all the information you've just read. That's gone. But this image endures. This endures because of an animation idea that I was told again and again. Where possible, show your story and don't tell it. And allow the player, allow the audience to interpret that story as they go and build it for themselves, and they'll thank you for it. So an example from a game that I think is particularly powerful, this is from Journey. The word Journey hasn't even arrived. This is just the title sequence, and you've climbed to the top of the hill. You see ahead of you a beacon on a mountaintop, and you go, ah, that's where I'm going. And it's going to take me a while, which is basically the story of Journey, told in one image at the very start of the game, and puts the whole game in context. So we know that we want to tell a story. We know that it's important to tell a story. So how do I personally go about this process? I'm going to give you a little background of what I do. So for me, the very first thing to do is that I have to break down the game mechanics that I need to support. It's no good having a good story if it doesn't support the game that you're trying to make. So in Wuga, what normally happens is that it's a very collaborative process. A game designer will come to me with a prototype, and I'll play it. And what I like to do is break it down into rules, rules that the artwork needs to support. So here's an example from a game that I worked on. The rules of this, it was a base building game, and you were going to be evil. Very important that you were going to be evil. Not only that, but the plans were that the, your troops were infinitely upgradable and multiple different upgrade tracks, and they were going to be disposable. And this was important because in the game prototype I played, you could explode them all at once with one touch of a button. All your troops, bang, they're dead. So you couldn't feel too much about them. If you felt it, it would feel bad. The audience wouldn't like that. They couldn't be babies. You can't go in exploding babies. That would be weird. So this is the first thing I do, write down my rules. The next step is to establish, obviously, what's already out there, because you can't do this. No matter how great that would have been for the game, doing this is just you're going to may as well cut your losses now. No one's going to play. It's too boring. So what I like to do is try and establish as quickly as possible a feeling for what the game's going to, make, going to be about. I do lots of these. They take about 30 minutes. They're photo bashing, mostly. And to get as efficiently as possible to the idea. And I would do many, many of these. But all of them have to satisfy those rules. So in this case, if, if a minion is magical, you don't mind exploding it, because it's not a real thing. So this works. Here are some of the other ones. These are some of my favorites. And what you're getting to here is the theme. What is the story about? What is this world about? But that's only half the conversation. That's not your story. That's just a part of it, because there's something missing. So if I was to say, think about this. I'm being attacked by vicious zombies, survival is uncertain, against such horrendous odds. And I want you to think for a moment of what that game looks like. All right? Well, I suggest that you know some of you might be thinking different things. It might be one of these. Both of these have the same theme, but they're incredibly different games. And they're different because of the artwork and what the artwork is saying. Or more, I like, I like to call it the tone. How does the artwork make you feel? And it starts telling the story from this initial image. So to go a bit further detail, imagine a game about dragons. These are all dragons, games and ideas about dragons. And they all have similar things. They have horns, they have wings, they have tails, it's dragons. But of course, they all feel completely different because of the artwork. And in free-to-play games, free-to-play mobile games particularly, where your downloads are coming not from a review. They don't necessarily hear about your games. They see an image. They see a marketing image. They see a, a, the App Store page. And what this really does, this artwork is going to define who downloads your game. 
So in this case, I would say you're talking fun, mixed casual game, and then mid-core, and when you're getting into the serious danger category here, you're sort of thinking about a core game. So that really means that your art and your narration have to work together to support your game. And this is not too difficult a task, because luckily, your audience is learning all the time. They're learning your game mechanics, but also learning about the artwork, learning about your story. And some people think that maybe our audience, are, they don't learn. But I can tell you a very good example. If I was to say, dum dum, dum dum, this has a meaning, right? We all know what this means. It means shark, like sharks are coming. And there's no reason why dum dum should mean shark. There's nothing in those tones that mean shark. It's just that from the picture jaws, every time a shark turns up, they play this music. So by the end of the film, they're intrinsically linked. We have learned that dum dum means shark. And you can do this throughout your game. And it's an idea called semiotics. It's that in every image that you create, it's a sequence of visual cues and patterns that we're pre-programmed to find and interpret and build a narrative around. So as an artist, you have a lot of opportunities to to and tools at your disposal to really use to create this narrative story, create the semiotics for the user. So I'm going to go through a, quick, a couple of them now. First off is value. This is essentially how bright or dark an image is. So a grayscale image. So I'm going to show again one from Star Wars. This is obviously black and white. So we see here a very clear conflict. We know that they don't get along. And at first, we think maybe this means that black is evil and white is good. But over the course of the film, they develop this language even further. So if I show this image, now these are Luke Skywalker's journey throughout the three films. And you can see at the start, he starts in white, innocent, open, loving. And over the course of the films, he gets tempted. Things happen to him. He gets darker. Until just before this last image, he is buttoned up to the neck in black. And he's had his lowest moment. This is the moment where he's tempted to the dark side. But as he overcomes that, his lapel falls open. You see this white, his inner goodness comes through. Now, for me, what I see this as, the meaning behind this, is that at the beginning of the films, the world is unbalanced, extreme good, extreme evil. And over the course of the films, the, the journey of Luke and Darth Vader together bring balance to the Force. And they've both learned and developed. And we've got this image at the end. That's the power that tone alone can give you. Now, in a game example, I really like this one from Limbo. I suppose most of you have probably played it. If you haven't, go out and play it. It's really excellent. And this is a 2D platformer game. And what the audience learn from tonal range here is first the game mechanics. They learn that everything in this gray zone is light gray. That's unimportant. Nothing really bad is going to happen to you there. All of the danger comes from this black area. And what that really does is create an amazing sense of unease in a platforming game where you can't see what's ahead of you. It's, it's uncomfortable. It makes you nervous. It makes you tense. But I think the really meaningful part of the art direction here, the real story that they're telling, this is a game with not a lot of like, text story or dialogue, is the fact that the little boy is also in silhouette. And for me, that implies that he's part of this world. He belongs there. It's quite an uncomfortable feeling when you're playing this game. So obviously, naturally, moving on from tone, we've got color. How can you use color to tell story in your work? Well, first off, you have to, I want to ask you a quick question. Again, you see this image it's from Team Fortress 2. Are they on the same side or not? I mean, in grayscale and tone value, we don't know. It has to go into color before we know who's who. And that's because, as people, we're pre-programmed to assume that if one group of people are in one color and another group are in a different color, then they're not friends. They're on opposite teams. And of course, they very cleverly used orange here to denote that this area is neutral space. So they're using the color to support the game mechanics. But again, like tone, you can start using it in an even further way to em embellish and support your story and your world that you're trying to create. This is from The Matrix. And you may not have realized this consciously when you're watching the film, but they clearly picked green tones for The Matrix and blue tones for everything that happens in the real world. And again, this is to help you as an audience understand where you are. This could be very confusing when you're watching it. But by using this green, whenever you see green, you know you're in the matrix. And again, nothing says that green is fake and blue is real world. It's just the language that we learn through watching the film. So I worked on a game called Futurama Game of Drones. It's really excellent. Go out and play it if you haven't already. 
And of course, um, this was a, a free-to-play casual puzzle game, and we wanted to have a, a really big story because it's a Futurama game. Story is incredibly important. And also, we wanted to have boss fights, so we needed a clear conflict. So the story we came up with was that the Pan Express crew had created delivery drones so they wouldn't have to work so hard. But unfortunately, that put them in clear competition with Mom and her Mamazon Primo drones. So that's free delivery you pay for, by the way, for very on message right now. And we put the story into the game everywhere we could. So we had the th 3D world maps that were story related. We had a fake Twitter page that people could read. And we also had interactive and animated comics to really push the story along. But for me, that's not enough. It has to go even further than that. Um, so in a color matching game like this, color is incredibly important. I have to hurry up. I'm already going over time, so I have to breeze through this somewhat. So obviously, you had to establish a color palette for the good drones. These are the Planet Express crew. But I also had to, we knew that the gamers would be playing this game, and they'd see the bad drones and the good drones all on the same screen. So I needed to come up with a color palette that was distinct and different for them, which was this one. And I used this throughout the game. Anytime mom had something, mom's logo, mom's ships, mom's drones, they're all using this color palette. So as the audience plays, they learn to recognize that. Because again, this is an audience who probably skips your tutorial text. So any clues that you can give through art will really help them understand your world. So lastly, this is about shape, shape language. Now, this is an example from Pixar's Up. It's probably one of my favorite examples of shape. And you can see that these are all different character designs, obviously, in the same world. But um, Carl, who's our main protagonist, he's all squares. He's very closed, very dependable. But you can see they're all stacked, so they're all nice and, f and straight and even. But he's not very open yet. Russell, on the other hand, this free, fun-loving buddy, he's all circles everywhere from his buttons to his nose, circles everywhere. And then, of course, the main antagonist, he's all triangles. And not only are they triangular, but they're all tilted and uneven, and it feels like, oh, it's so uncomfortable. But again, like, like uh, Lucas, um, they, Pixar doesn't just rest on having a really good underlying structure. They use it throughout the film to support their story. And you can see this is the development of Carl from start to finish as he goes from a very rounded character right down to a very square character. And then he starts to come back again. Some of that roundness comes back as he finishes his journey. So in my own work, I was working on a game called Divinity. It's a mid-core PvP game. It looked something like this. Um, so this is a theme and tone. It's a, it was a tribal battle game. And you had to have this like, happy, dark feel. It had to be OK to kill things. So I was asked to do a tank unit. And you can see these are my rules that I wrote for myself. So again, it was going through the same process again and again. And I think, OK, tribal warriors, tank unit, mammoth. That's clearly what we have to do. <laughs> but it just didn't feel right. There was something wrong about it. This is a unit that had to feel very desirable and very powerful. And it was just too rounded. It was too sweet. You could cuddle it. It didn't feel dominating. So we changed it to be a lot more strong, a lot more powerful, just through shape language alone. Everything else more or less say the same. And that changed exactly how everyone was going to feel about it in the world that they created. So I would like to sum up. I mean, obviously, these are the tools at your artist's disposal, value, color, and tone that you can use to create a whole world for people without ever saying anything at all. No words, just images. So in the end, what I think of is that good art supports your game mechanics. But great art supports your game mechanics and the story you want to create. Because nar narrative in a game, especially in the, the time we are now, is becoming increasingly important. Your users are beginning to expect it. Here's the five-star reviews that we got from Futurama. And the vast majority of them mention the, the story specifically. And in the end, having a good story is really about communication. It's communicating with your team. So you're all on the same page. You all understand what it is you're trying to create. You have a reference point to go back to that you can use to make choices about your art, about your game. But not only that, then a company like Wooga, we have all these other service teams that we need. We have uh, the PR, marketing, customer support, community management, and all these people also need to understand your game. And a good story can help you with that. But not only that, it's really about communicating with your players reminding them about why they care about your game. Why am I here? Why am I playing your game and not someone else's game? Because in the end, a good story makes them feel something. And that's what making games is all about. Hi, I'm Christian. Thanks for sharing all the information. Um, you, you mentioned that you try to create such themes. Do you basically just um, 
think about the topic of the game and then you Google it and basically you throw, <laughs> you create a collage out of it and yeah, that's it. Um, so basically what I normally do when I'm playing the game, a couple of ideas will come to you naturally at the very start, but often those ideas are a bit cliche, right? They're the first ideas you have. Now it's important to look at those as well. But I'm trying to find the new information, the, the information, the theme that people start feeling excited about. So yeah, when I, I list them all down, all the worlds in my head that I might f feel appropriate. But I found that um, just saying this to people didn't really get them excited. I had to show it in a visual way. Um, and the most efficient way of doing that would be like, for in the case of the Harry Potter one, not Harry Potter, obviously, was to Google kind of wizards and find images that I thought would get that feeling. And they won't necessarily mean the game would look like that. It's more just about communicating to the team what the world could feel like. But yeah, great question. Thanks very much. Hi, thanks a lot for the presentation. Yeah, thanks very really much. great. Um, a question relating to like production and why you're actually making the game. Like mm -hmm. sometimes I'm sure it happens. You get business people or producers going, "Hey, we don't have time for this. This is too expensive." You know. <laughs> so how would you typically deal with like these pushbacks around narrative and visuals? Um, well, I think firstly. Uh, looking in Ruga, that Ruga really cares about story, and story is, is part of their process. I mean, we see this with games like Pros Peril, that the story is integral, and getting that story right is important. Obviously, we try and test that these stories resonate with people fairly early on. We often do little images and test them with sort of A-B test and, and click-through surveys to find that, you know, does this world, like, will it matter to the audience? So we try and get the buy-in from, from management as early as possible. This is very, but then the point is that you're making these decisions anyway. You have to decide what the character is going to look like anyway. And you're going to decide what color it is and what shape it is. And so you need at least a framework for making those choices. Otherwise, you could find yourself just vacillating between like, all these different options, which all feel fine, but don't you know, resonate. So I think um, that would be how I'd say it to people, that without this, you're going to waste time going down all these rabbit holes and not finding the clear vision. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I actually have a question. So we yep. have before before the session we talked about the whole like kind of how the narrative starts like already before they've installed the game, and yes. now you now you mentioned that you have a framework at Wuga. So how do you kind of balance the needs of like you know just marketing? Like you need to drive you need to drive installs, yes. but on the other hand you also need to start telling the story already at the App Store page. How do you actually yep. facilitate that? Well, this is actually a really good point, because sometimes the story of the game isn't going to sell your game as much as, say, just an image of the game itself. But um, I kind of think about it like um, if you, if you want to go find some food, and you, you're hungry, and you want food, you don't care what the product branding of the food is. It's more important to see that it's a hamburger, because that's what you want. So to a certain extent, you have to make sure that people know what game it is. But then you want to remind them that the feeling of the game and that the world of the game is, is as meaningful as the, as the actual mechanic. So it's about creating a balance. And what we do is we try lots of different approaches, and we'll test different things and see what works. Um, but yeah, always show your game mechanics first off. That's so important. But then try and find ways of informing them of what the game is going to feel like and what the world is going to be as well. Wuga, Wuga sounds like a kind of a magical place where there's no conflict between <laughs> marketing and, and creative. That <laughs> sounds pretty great to me. Well, of course, there's always going to be conflict as people try and find the common vision for what the game is going to be and how we're going to see it. But we're very collaborative, and I think it's about respect and respecting each other's areas of expertise. So marketing knows things that, of course, I don't know. And, and I have a unique vision on the game, so it's about finding the, the point where we match. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, I'm curious about how you sort of like balance feedback um, because often I find that when you start a game you want to have very strong feedback on what you're doing mm -hmm. and then when you've played a game for six months the feedback drives you absolutely crazy so how do you sort of like balance that type of sort of validation feedback on mm -hmm. doing things um, yeah, that's a really good point. I think that feedback throughout a process is, is really important. Um, what I try and do is uh, reflect on what the feedback is trying to say. And obviously, if you're just before a launch, if someone tells you they don't like your story, there's not, you can't really work with that. That's not something you're going to change at this point. But if you try and find out why they don't like it and understand where they're coming from, then maybe it's something really small that they're just not being able to tell you. Um, and it's trying to understand what it is that they're trying to tell you. But I think um, what we try and do is, is go from general to particular, always with our designs. So 
Um, it should, if you decide at the very early outset with like theme splashes like that one I did, that this is the world you're going for, then everyone understands it. And if they don't like it then, then of course you don't do it, you change. But if they do like it, then you've got this sort of tacit acceptance that that's the world you're creating. So hopefully by the time you actually get to, to sort of soft launch that everyone at least in the company is behind your vision. And then it's about hopefully getting the players to love it as well. Um, so I always try and balance feedback. Also with production, there's certain times that feedback, you can't loop it through your process as much as you would like. Okay, uh, I guess we'll wrap it up now. So please give a big round of applause for Rihanna. Thank you very much.